All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me introduce to you our speaker for today. It's Marius and Denise Chris for Security Business Enabler, how to align your security program to business goals. So over to you, Denise and Marius. Brilliant. Uh, Marius, do you want to give the context since you're the one that came up with this amazing mm -hmm. topic, which I'm very passionate about. So happy yeah. to have a nice conversation about it. Yeah, I think, you know, kind of going through experience and the materials I've been reading, you know, the, the more and more I, I kind of see, I guess, examples of where sometimes security is, is, is in a kind of in its own sphere with just you know addressing security problems and it's not it's not aligning to where the business is going where the business goals are and and it's missing sometimes i i, I often hear from for example having conversations with CISOs that you know they lack engagement with the board or they lack approval for certain projects and i think it's sort of sometimes it can be a problem on both sides because if you, as a security professional, whether it's CISO or, or any anyone within an organization that's trying to make, you know, create security programs, create security projects and initiatives, um, and you struggle to get traction, it, it, it's not always a problem of the board or, or, you know, someone that, you know, makes the approvals. I think we have to align our um, communication, our in a way, sort of storytelling yeah. to align to the business goals, how we can actually get, you know, over the line. Because normally, you know, for example, even now I started, I have a few, you know, questions, for example, pinned down when, when I discussed with my CFO. And sometimes I think people miss miss those, you know, questions, those uh, or communications and, and engagement with an organization. For example, you know, I, I have a question, you know, for example, like, how do you calculate business value? you know, how do you determine the, the value, you know, what, you know, what delivers value to investors? And sometimes we in security, we, we don't know answers to these questions. So it's, it's, you know, when you create a security program, you know, it's, 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 sometimes you can miss those key, you know, questions or key areas that you can tailor your story, you know, how, how we can embed that security program into the business. Yeah. So well, let, let's explore that question, right? Because I think it's it's a great challenge, right? And I and I actually think that sometimes in security we we're not challenged enough. And to be honest, the fact that you you know you get the challenge is already good because it gives an opportunity to respond, right? So I think the, the the and this is a little bit different on regulated industries, right? It's a little bit industry, you know. On on I would say regulatory, government sort of you know certain industries that have another level, they are you know. I guess you, know, you can still answer this way, but there, there's, there's something else in there, right? Because sometimes, you know, regulation might mean you, you're in business or not, right? But I, I think the best way to start answering that question, what value do you provide, is basically looking and saying, okay, what value, what, you know, what, what, what is valuable for the business, right? Like what, what does the business care about? And then once you map that out, your, your answer is how you protect that. Yeah. Right. So if you know, you know, I, I know you work a bit for Domino's, right? So we probably can use that as an example, right? So if, you know, Domino's cares about delivering great customer service, right? Great, great pizzas, great connections, great stuff, right? So, you know, how does the security team of Domino's make sure that the pizzas get delivered, right? How do they make sure that, you know, a the you know, and, and also the customers are taken care of, right? So, so I think that if you start by unpacking, what does the business care about? Right, and and that's an it's interesting question because you'll find that you know especially the more you go senior, they care about sometimes different things, right? And there's there's always an element some people care about making money, you know, but there, there's a lot of ones they care about the business. They care about having a, a a resilient business, having business that can actually accelerate or business that can grow very fast, right? And on all of those, we have a plan, right? We 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 actually can make a difference. So, you know, if anything, you know, the security team should be able to answer the question, where are you adding value, right? By aligning to what the business considers valuable. 
Yeah, exactly. And sometimes, you know, I think the key point as well, and, and you know, especially now talking, you know, where where you create specific, for example, security initiatives and security projects, we normally go into the board, for example, addressing specific risks. Yeah. But sometimes if you can, you can, for example, sometimes spin specific so stories that you're not only addressing risk, but potentially we are doing revenue protection yeah. and how particular security you know, initiatives can even save costs. You know, if you can map out, you know, in terms of, you know, understanding business revenue, business, you know, financials, and you can map, you know, specific projects, you know, how they're going to protect revenue, what even, you know, savings you can provide down the line, you know, and, you know, where's going to be the sum costs and things like that, where, you know, you start talking about actual numbers, yep. it can be a great benefit and can be a great game changer in those conversations when you, you know, seek yep. approval for specific initiatives. Yep. And I would say that's the evolution, right? I, I think that the, the first generations of security teams are basically, you know, uh, make sure the boat is not sinking, you know, patch the holes, you know, get to a level of, of security maturity, right, at, at, at different levels. And I, and I think a lot of them know, you know I guess the difference, you know, for the, for the one of us who's been doing this for a while, but right? I think there's, there's a level of security that, you know, we know how to do that, right? It's a question of having enough people, enough budget, enough, enough desire to do that, right, or enough time you you can get to a, a certain level of maturity in your security in isolation right like regardless whatever whatever type of company you are right you you can lab and also there's been some really good innovations right recently on some of the big providers some of the cloud stuff again the move from main data centers into other environments helps a lot right because you stop having single points of failure there's there's a lot better technology right that helps and I think the first generation of a security team, they, that's where they live, right? And, I, and, I, and, and unfortunately, there's a lot of security teams that are comfortable with that. that that's where they want to be. They don't make a lot of connections to the other parts of the business. They almost like live in this constant state of frustration. But I think, like you said, some of it, I think, is self-inflicted, right? Because I think you put yourself in a bubble and then you complain that, oh, I'm in a bubble, right? <laughs> People yeah. don't have context, right? Um, uh, and, I, and I think that's, you know, the, the, the next level is when you really start to interact with the business and start to, you know, answer those questions. The, the problem is that you very quickly hit the business layer, right? Almost, you know, by, by design of doing that. And, and then it's a, a tough one because you're now dealing with a lot of frustrations in how the business works and how business sometimes don't work very well, how this department doesn't like that department, how the guys at the top don't have a good understanding how things actually work, right? And, and you, need, you need to navigate that, right? You need to navigate and, and also understand where you add value, where we don't add value. Yeah, but I think that's that's the kind of key point. You know, we I always you know discuss with people saying you know compliance does not equal security and security does not yeah. equal compliance. Correct. My goal in in the organization, you know, because when we start specific initiatives or, or you know we go out and discuss with with all the business functions, you know, how does this specific specific initiative or program can affect your day to day work. You know, and then we discuss pain points and we come to a solution. But that's, you know, spreading that message outside of just your, you know, normal, usual IT remit. You foster relationships and at the same time, you create a security culture. You know, I think, you know, nowadays it, it's, it's the, the companies are changing and evolving. You know, we've gone past, you know, addressing just security within IT. We're launching, you know, Security Champions Network. I'm a yeah. big proponent of that. And then, you know, on top of that, you can overlay with cybersecurity committee, which, you know, if you embed senior stakeholders within, within the organization, if you discuss any particular initiatives and you have a cybersecurity committee built out of senior stakeholders within, within business, you get an, a buy-in from them there. It's easier than to go to the board because you already have a buy-in from the business. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, absolutely, right? And so the, the trick... That, and in my world, everything's a graph, right? And I connect everything and I, and we use, I try to use Jira for this. So the thing that we're now trying to do, and, and this is hard to do without a graph, right? But you know, when, you, when you start to have a graph, this at least is possible, is to really have a direct connection. For, and, and this is a conversation I'm literally having with, with a team right now, where are we going? Okay, so security team, you, you're doing X, right? 
why are you doing that? So we're now starting to map the key results, for example, for a sprint. So the security team now works in sprints, right? So we say, okay, why are you doing that? Okay, so that's a, what you're doing. And that's the key result, right? And then what's interesting is to say, okay, that's the key result, but why, you, you know, what's the objective? Oh, okay, that's an objective. So either you got like an OKR, right? And what's that part of? Oh, that's part of this project, which is part of this program. And then we start to ask, and I'm trying, I get, I'm trying to get my risk team to, to do this in effective ways that, but why are you doing it? Why, why are you doing that activity, right? There has to be a reason, right? It's not just you woke up one day and, it, and say, I well, to do that. So the why is, is the risks. If you think about it, I'm doing this because I have this and that and that risk, right? So now the graph starts from the key results, to objectives, to a project, to the risks that we're trying to eliminate, mitigate. And ironically, something we very rarely do in security, what risks you are creating. Because sometimes we actually create risks, right? In our projects and the stuff that we do, right? But let's say you've got to eliminate and, and mitigate certain risks. And then what we try to do with those risks is ask the five whys. Why does this risk matter, right? And you go, oh, because of this. And you go, why does that matter? Oh, because of that. And why does that matter? Oh, because of this, right? So eventually you have you know, a, a top level risk for the business. So, so here's an example of, of something I, I, I did when a, a new, man, new risk analyst started. I says, okay, so we have a risk, a fact today is that you don't know how to use Jira, right? Fact, right? Because it's just started, right? It's just, you don't know how to use the way we do Jira, right? Yeah. For risk management. That's a fact. You, you can't deny you just started, right? So a key result for that person is learn how we use Jira, how, how we do risk management, become an admin, break Jira. That's the key result, right? You have to break Jira a little bit, fix it, you know, et cetera. So what, what is the consequence of that fact? Well, the consequence of the fact is, the risk team, you know, or elements of the risk team don't know how to use Jira for risk management, right? Well, that's a risk, right? But why is that a risk? Is because the security team is not able to effectively manage risks. Okay, why is a risk? Oh, because from a governance and compliance point of view, we don't have a scalable way, right, to manage risk. And that's a compliance risk. So now I have a direct line between a compliance risk that has just become a bit higher or is, is critical all the way down to the key result and the fact that is doing that, right? And, yeah. and the beauty of this, you now have the ability to say, okay, but who cares about compliance? Oh, it's, it's the CFO, right? Is the, the, you know, the legal department, is the general counsel, right? It's those individuals. So they now are the stakeholders of this risk. So now if we don't have time to do training, for example, and I don't have budget to do training, for example, I need to go back to those stakeholders and saying, hey, we can't do this for you. So you can see that the beauty of this, if you can do this off, is you can connect all the way from the, the action on the ground all the way to the stakeholder. So, so the model now we're trying to put in place is one where we're able to say what we do, but also what we don't do. So we can actually go to a stakeholder and saying, hey, you know, you're gonna have to accept this risk. And, and now the trick is, this is really cool is, Every risk that we have have to be accepted because by design, the risk exists. The only question is high, medium, and low, and et cetera. And then we, we basically say that you have three periods for you to accept the risk, which is one month or two weeks to a month, three months, and six months. So the two weeks to a month is the risk that we actually have a key result. We actually have somebody assigned to it. We believe that we will make a dent on that risk in two to three weeks, right? Which basically means the risk profile should change goes lower, gets eliminated, et cetera, right? The ones in three months is the ones that we believe we can do it. We have in our budget. We, we should be able to get to it, but it's probably only going to be done between two and three months, right? And then the ones for six months is the ones that we don't have budget. We're not going to do it. In six months from now, they still will exist, right? And what's cool about this is that it, it really drives that accountability to the business. So when you go to the business owners, right, the ones you talked about, the plan is to say, hey, these are the risks that you now own. And by the way, this one's, we're doing something about it. And this one's, we're not doing anything about it. But you own it because you are the business owner of that. And, and now getting that language right is difficult because you, you can only do this if you can focus on where we started, which is what do they care about? Yeah. Right? And, and if you have a stakeholder that cares about X, we, from a security point of view, need to have the data to say, I'm not able to protect X. Sorry, you know, because I have 10 X's here and, and, and I, those two at the moment in our strategy 
have been mapped and yours, you know, we'll, we'll get to it in six months from now. Yeah. And the key point is what you're making here as well. I guess it depends in the business who you're talking with as well, because, <clears throat> you know, you can't have a same narrative to, to, the, to every single person mm -hmm. in the sees we did that you are reaching out. You need to understand the, what the CFO care about, what the COO care about, and what the CIO care. And they have a different personalities. They will have different Absolutely. approaches. So, you you know, it's sometimes just, you know, we, we often discuss, you know, oh, CISOs, what do you do first 90 days? You know, it's these one of the key things that sometimes are overlooked, you know. What does yeah. CFO care about? You know, how do they like communicating? Do they like regular checkups? Do they like email, you know, lockdowns? How are we going to understand to approach them and how are we going to, you know, communicate with them yeah. well? So we, yeah. so we could those resolve those X risks if they are responsible for, you know, that they would get through to them. Absolutely. But also more importantly, you need to translate to their language, right? And yeah. this is where I think a lot of security teams get stuck because my, look, my premise is we have our own language, right? We have our own standards. We have our own ways of doing things. And I have no problems saying that we map to NIST. We map to GDPR, we map to our security framework, we map there, we map there. That's cool. That gives us a foundational way to be coherent throughout the business, right? But there's a moment, this is why I like graphs. There's a moment that you can create a connection to a complete different language, right? It's almost like imagine there's a part of your graph that suddenly speaks, you know, Klingon, right? And I don't understand fucking Klingon, but I know that the guy at the top, whoever understands Klingon, was able to create a connection to the top level risks that the guys get it, right? And where we start. So it's the same way, right? Like you, you need, like you said, you need, you need to have a, a part of your graph that talks about financial risk, a part of your graph that talks about operational risk, a part of your graph that talks about corporate risk, a part of your graph that talks about human resources, right? And, you know, and, and that's, you know, what those guys care about, right? And that's fine. You know, we, we, it's almost like it's easy for us if you have a, a good graph structure to almost say, how do you want to talk? Like, what, what makes sense to you? What do you care about? And then you ask, why? Why do you care about that? Okay, cool. Another note in the graph. Why do you care about that? Cool. What you then need is to have a, a coherent mapping that makes sense that you can walk people through to say, well, you care about this. Well, that is caused by that. And that is caused by this. And now you go technical. And that's fine because... You know, in a way, the high levels is still, although you might end up very geek at the bottom, it's still kind of high level. Oh, you got sexual hijacking. What is that? Oh, is it user impersonation. Why that? You know, so that's still easy concepts. And then you start to go deep, right? And, and for me, that's the key. We need to be able to have a system that allows us to translate what we do into whatever the other person cares about. And I think that's the model versus they care about X or Y, because even that will change over time. The same yeah. person within six months could completely change what they care about, right? So you have to have a model that reflects to it, right? Reflects to what they care about, where is the business going and what are we doing to protect that? Yeah, exactly. And that's why, you know, that's why normally we're talking, you know, we have a sort of a security program in time because obviously you, you the goal is to to mature it and 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 you know progress it over the time but you know at a specific points in, in the business time you will care about different things you know mm -hmm. you might have at the moment working with one client so obviously that's your way or crown jewels are you might have 10 clients in a year and you will have completely different you yeah. know um pain points at that time you know and and you alluded you know <clears throat> i think you, you know where sometimes I think security professionals struggle is is having empathy, having good communication skills. You know, one one always conversation kind of springs to mind. You know, we always sometimes you know end up at you know um, crossing you know our hairs with with development teams, and 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 a kind of conversation from examples comes to point where you know, for example, development team deploys code and, and they, you know, as sometimes happens, they deploy code with vulnerabilities. So normally yeah. a security person will go and, you know, start shouting, why are you deploying code with, with vulnerabilities? But the key point is follow the thread to the bottom and actually finding out why they, that happened, you know? Exactly. The question is why you deployed. And they will say, oh, we didn't have time, but why you didn't have time, you know? Oh, yeah. because our KPIs are based on bugs and develop, uh, delivering new features. 
okay, so why your KPIs are developed on that? And then you need to get to, the, to follow to the thread because, for example, in their KPIs, is nothing says about vulnerable code. So then yeah. it's up to you how you can manipulate or create, uh, you know, relationships where we can change those KPIs. Because, for example, fixing a vulnerability code in production can save you ten times the cost of fixing it in pre-production. You know, and, and and changing those KPIs. So, you know, instead of sometimes, you know, you would get a vulnerable code, and then security will just start shouting, and you will gonna get nowhere because you'll just get angry at development teams. So, in that case. Okay, you 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 got to the root cause, which is the developer team does not have the training or the time or visibility, right, on on those things. Do you create a risk for those teams for that? Well, well, they, there's a few flip sides where you can do. I think because one one point I mentioned, they they have no KPIs around vulnerable code. So if if you can go to the top of the development team, whoever's in yeah. the CTO or someone. And you can yeah. address and and discuss that you know they should be in the KPIs and and okay and telling but they benefits. don't today right like let's let's walk this through right this is really cool but they don't today right yeah so you can create a risk in fact you can create a fact right yeah. which is that team does not have a KPI to develop secure code yeah right and that's a fact right yeah you establish it. it's a fact right so you can create a risk which is. We, you know, the team that don't have KPI will create security vulnerabilities, Yeah. right? So my thinking is that when you go and talk to the manager, right, instead of trying to explain why and all that stuff, you get that person to accept that risk. That's the first step. And I guarantee you that the moment you make that person accept that risk is the moment that their focus completely changes. Yeah, completely yeah. because there's you know like i was telling my team we wanted to get some policies approved i said tell them to sign off the policy and they're like well, well, well it's not ready no no get them to sign off whatever state the policy is and i guarantee you they're actually going to read it if, if you go let's review policies let's do this let's do that fuck, you're going to be there a month from now and you're still going to be in the same place so getting somebody to accept even like these days like we'll put a screenshot on slack it's just add an emoji just like, dude, just go and emoji that because I can take that screenshot, put in Jira and create a connection with it. But just getting that almost, and it's not passive aggressive, but that just definition of a fact in the way that they are accountable makes that conversation 10 times more productive. Well, yeah, yeah. Right? Of course. As, soon, as soon as you're assigning someone the risk, then, you know, their ears perk up because obviously... So, but that's, but that's the thing because then they're going to go, oh, okay let's and then that's that's where that month three months six months is quite cool because you can say all right so so now you see it's almost like you're guiding the conversation now you say okay so you want to accept this risk for a month two weeks uh, a month three months six months basically you're asking when you're going to change this right and if, if that person has no intention of adding a kpi for example to do that they go cool then accept this for six months Right. And, yeah. and, and that's where then it gets interesting. If you, for example, you already have examples of vulnerabilities that got created or problems from that team. And he says, look, so that means that, you know, we know this team is going to create another five vulnerabilities in the next three months. Right. Because in the last three months, they did it. If you still don't have training and KPIs and, and requirements and you don't have some of the testing and stuff like that, then, you know, statistically, they will create another five or 10 in the next three months. So then you start to allow the conversation to context. And is that okay, right? It's, does it matter? You know, does the application have assets that matter to the organization? Yeah. But you see, I think the key there is you have to create that risk. You need to have a platform that allows that risk, right? And, um, you know, um, you know that risk to, to for them for the and not the, it's not the developer team is the business owner is whoever controls the developer team roadmap. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, they it's, a, it's, it's they're a key, the ones that matter. It's a key point in that in that journey, I guess as well. You know, so, so sometimes uh, I think and and that uh, another example just springs actually. I was I was interviewing a few people over the last few days. <clears throat> In a GRC space, and obviously, I was talking with one person because they they had experience in ISO twenty seven thousand one, and I was like, you know, it's um, 
again, you know, going back to the conversation, compliance does not equal security and security does not equal compliance. Yeah. But the problem is, I think sometimes where people fail to get traction within the business or fail to actually implement the, the, the specific frameworks like ISO 27001, because they don't get the business drivers and business in buy-in of why we are delivering it. Yeah. So basically, the person who I interviewed with, they said, oh, the CISO promised ISO 27001 to the board, and that's why we are delivering it. But there was no particular buy-in from the business. They were, they, you know, it, it got to a point where they needed to implement Annex A controls, and they yeah. started struggling yeah. because there was no buy-in from the business. There's no alignment to, you know, the whole security and business goals. And it's starting to almost fall apart, you know. Because yeah. and that's a good again, example of then you have a lot of people doing a lot of work without context, which is you're bound to burn a lot of bridges. You're going to struggle to get stuff done, and it's going to be ten times more expensive from a business point of view, right? This is almost like you 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 need to create a risk for the risk team for the security team, and saying you're not doing it right. Right, like yeah. the risk here is that this is going to be a lot more. In fact, you even risk not, you know, not being uh, secure, right? Because you know those compliance frameworks they should be a side effect of good security practices, right? Exactly. Because there's a reason why we do all that stuff, right? And if you don't put the context in place, right, you know, you you lose that ability to get the buy-in from the, the right parts of the business. Yeah, and especially you know that some of these frameworks like. For example, ISO 27001, they are underpinned by continual improvement. It's not point in yeah. time, get exactly. certificate, we show to everyone and we're done. You know, we finish doing security, we go, we achieve compliance. And that's and that's I think the key point where sometimes you know organizations can fall by the wayside. You know, we when you decide to go, for example, for that ISO 27001, you go on a journey of continual improvement that's yeah. underpinned by risk that, you know, you align to your organization goals. And I always, you know, come from the story, from the kind of story where, you know, we are going for, for example, specific like frameworks as a business differentiator. We can show to the clients how much, you know, work we're doing to protect their customer data. You know, that there can be a business differentiator in terms of business development. You can preach, you know, to your potential clients that, you know, you're doing security well, and that can be a you know a potential business winner and business generator. Yeah, absolutely right. And I think that's that's what we need to to give context in, right? We need to provide context to you know to those things to make sure that you know the right element and the standard, right? And 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 in my head, you need to create those graphs, right? So that when you talk to the right individuals, in a way, detail matter, right? Like you know, you have to be able to go to somebody and says, hey your actions will make us not compliant with that, that, that action, right? And that action is required for this, requires for that. So if you don't do this, then we're not compliant here, which means not compliant over there. So we, we're using NIST actually for that. And, and we're trying to map our projects to the NIST framework. So we can now say, again, you know, when I was saying that we, by the way, we're not mapping this across, then the next level down is to say, yeah, but then it means from this framework, we're not compliant with this. Right, or we have a level of maturity which is lower, and and you are the reason why. But I, I think being able to get the data to have those conversations is really hard, right? But then once you have it, I think the stakeholders start to understand it, right? Which is, I think the the core here is that if, if from a security point of view we don't have the right data to go and have those meetings and to make those stakeholders accountable, then this is not going to work. Well, yeah, yeah. You know, that's why, you know, it's not only in in, in, in business data is king, in, in, in making decisions data is key, you know, because the more data points you have, yep. the more, o o you know, overall decision you can make, the more you can see into what is actually happening and where where potential things are failing or where things are going well. Yeah. So so what, what do you think, um, you know, what, what, what do you think of the, um, you know, the idea that, you know, uh, we, we talk a lot about securing having a seat at the board or having high visibility right, at high levels. But I, I would argue that, yes, we need that, but it's actually not because of security, it's because of the visibility and the business intelligence that we can provide. Because you see, security is, is one of those unique um, places that um, we have access to all the data. 
right? So yeah. we we get data feeds from everywhere, and we can actually talk to everybody. We can correlate a lot of stuff, right? So and there's very few, if any, function actually, especially with the technical ability, right? You can argue that finance also talks to a lot of people, but only talks actually to very thin layers of the business, right? So we have the ability to talk to everybody and actually be involved in just about every part of the business because in a way when there's an incidence you know there's no distinction between the bits that we involved versus not involved right if it's digital if it's data if it's security like it's a security incident right so i know what, what do you think of the idea that you know the more we provide visibility the more we provide um what's it called um you know sort of uh, the ability to provide insight to the business and, and actually have those, those strategic conversations, the more valuable it will become as a function. Yeah, and that's why I think I think it's a key benefit. But and I think that's why sometimes it's very hotly discussed topic of where, for example, CISO should report. Should they report it to CIO yeah. or to CTO? Because normally, if they report to one of the other C suites like CIO or CTO, there's normally a there is a conflict of interest in some way yeah. because CIO is, you know, normally responsible with um, IT, you know, CTO has other responsibilities and there's always, um, I think, clashes of opinion. So being a CISO and being able to get a reporting arm into the board where you can create those narratives and have that conversation, you know, that's why I'm always, you know, discussing about having things like, you know, running business impact analysis because you can you can you know address the pain points of the businesses you know where is your faults in your bcp and dr scenarios because these are the kind of areas that sometimes you know the board and senior execs might be have sleepless nights because you know crown jewels whatever happens you need to make sure that the crown jewels are still operating and and, and generating revenue exactly so having, so having conversations directly to the people who are responsible for you know for the business direction it can be a big differentiator right and, and obviously as you say we being security having visibility into all of the data and all of the platforms and, and everything that you know is running within an organization can provide a you know a key perspective especially that we are not the people who own the risk we are there as an informed advisor to the to the board and and, and you know raising potential issues and risks yeah but then you know it isn't you know the fact that we we can provide lots of insights and business insights into those those threads insanely valuable like like for example like if you pay a lot of attention to the data that you get from from the web let's say right web traffic you can actually tell a lot of insights on what's going on you can tell when marketing campaigns are effective you can tell when bugs have hit the website you can tell when you know you have journeys who now are not effective you can basically say you know hey you know this particular journey is actually you know has a huge amount of attrition because that data is in there right you know yeah. that 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 information in a way is actually available because you know you you were able to you know for example like one of the pieces of works that we're now starting to do is identifying you know malicious users because i want to make their lives really hard but in proxy you start to identify power users you start to identify good users you know and 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 you know you could argue that a, a really effective web application or web platform should be able to protect the users be able to say hey you know i could even shut down half of my functionality but as long as you know, the 80% that's, you know, my 20% users use all the time, as long as that's still up, then the impact is still, you know, very, you know, minimal, right, on, on, on a big disruption. So, mm -hmm. so I, I feel that there's a lot of metrics, a lot of insights that we have that we can give to other teams, right, you know, in, in, in that level. Yeah, but and it's, you know, I guess it depends on organization because sometimes you can be it can be hard, you know. That's why I think I guess for example, for me it's different because I joined now startup world where, for example, I get, you know, I have a for, for example a, a CEO that says, you know, we have a meetings with the whole team of talking about business direction, mm -hmm. and he said, I want to hear ideas not only about security but about where the business is going because you might have some fresh perspective on yeah. you know, customer journey, on business journey, and having that ability to, you know, voice your opinion, it's 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 great because we kind of have quite a flat structure in that sense that everyone can 
have an input of where the business is going. And that can be a game changer. Whereas, you know, if you have a big organization, sometimes there is there's a lot of politics involved. There's a lot of, you know, people protecting their positions. And, you know, yeah, yeah. it can be hard to achieve that. Yeah, I, I look, and, and that's awesome, right? Like, I think it's it's, it's great when you have the ability and when the, the top execs, right, uh, want to hear that. And I feel insecurity, you know, sometimes we, we can provide lots of amazing insights, right? So, and actually, we, we should be able to do that from data-driven, right? We should be able to say, hey, the data that we see, you know, even the fact that, you know, this department uses five spreadsheets and another department using a modern cloud platform, you know, great, right? I guess which one most likely is going to be more productive, right? <laughs> You know, and there's all sorts of insights that I think, yeah. And I think that's that's where you, you start to use security. And, and actually the sweet spot is when, when you make the business case for a security technology or security capability that actually will make the business better, accelerate faster, or, you know, uh, evolve in a, in a much more effective way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Especially, you know, I think we can be differentiators in, in various fields because I think we, you know, being security department normally, you are probably the first one to to leverage automation, no. and spreading automation sort of you know frameworks within any other parts of the organization, whether it's data, whether it's you know any operational procedures where you can automate specific things. You know you can save a lot of time and people's you know uh, scratching their heads. Yeah. Okay, so I have a, a, a variation of this topic, right? In terms of the business, because sometimes we, we we always talk about risk and reduction stuff like that. But I I feel there's lots of times where also our job is to let the business take risks, right? Our yeah. job is to tell the business, you know what, you know you can do that kind of stuff, right? Or it's more risky because we can protect it here, we can protect it there, or we we able to tell the business, okay, here's the compromise. We can reduce security here, we can improve it there, we can basically allow you to do maybe some more insecure practices, which basically, you know, reduce friction with customers, reduce friction with what we want to do. And of course, that the job here is to make sure that you don't cross that line, right? You don't cross the line where now you're taking risks in a way that can have catastrophic effects, right? But but I feel that that's, again, a language that a lot of senior execs understand because they do that across the board. They spend their day making risk-based decisions, right? Yeah. So we should be going to them and saying, look, here are the options, right? Like this is more risky, but they, here's the side effects. This is less risky, but then that's the side effects. Now you make a business decision and then you take responsibility for it. Yeah, I think it's um, it's a it's a great way to think, especially... I'm not being in a startup. Sometimes you have to take risks if you want to accelerate your growth. Mm -hmm. It's weighing up the risks of, you know, in particular areas where you can make risk and where you can't, you know, take risks. So it's having that knowledge and context because, you know, for example, so I guess kind of in a way, it's a, the perfect example is um, on LinkedIn, somebody messaged, you know, what is your opinion of CVSS scores? Mm -hmm. CVSS is one point of data. And I think from... If you talk from kind of legacy point of thinking, you know, we used to think about, you know, we discover vulnerability that's 9.0 and everyone, should, you know, jumps and shouts, oh, patch, 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 patch tomorrow. But nowadays we start talking about threat intelligence. We started about, yeah. started talking about mitigating, you know, other specific controls, you know, because, you know, before we used to just shout patch, but now we need to, you know, we need to look at it. Where is that vulnerability? Is it in a in a crown jewels? Is it somewhere on receptionist laptop? You know, yeah. we have mitigating controls. Is this actual vulnerability being exploited in a live environment? You know, what's the conditions and when they can be when this vulnerability yeah. can be exploited? You know, so when you overlay all of this other context around it, sometimes you don't even worry about patching, even though it might be serious or critical vulnerability because yeah. it can't be exploited in your network. So well, goes, but, but, but here's the thing, right? Like, also, what where you are there is that you know, given of course that you know, if we could, we would patch, right? But there's a there's a point of diminishing returns, and the point of you don't have the resources to deal with that asset, as because it's not as critical as these assets here that we are protecting, right? Yeah, I I feel the sweet spot that we don't do very well, at least I have not seen done very effectively is to go to the owners of those assets and tell them we can't protect you. Because that's, in fact, think about it. That's what you've done, right? What you've done in that decision flow is to say that asset because of ABC, because XYZ, although it has a crazy vulnerability, 
you know, if you take into account the asset, where it is, the risk, you know, the threat ages, et cetera, right? We're not going to protect it. Now, for that asset itself, that might not be the best decision, yeah. right? <laughs> because from the asset point of view, you know, there's a, a much higher probability that it will be popped, right? That will have problems, et cetera. But it, your analogy is that, or your, your analysis is that from a business point of view, we're not going to protect it because of this very pragmatic sequence of events. What I think we need to do better is to tell the owners of that to say, because of budget limitations, team limitations, you know, time limitations, et cetera, we're not able to protect you right now, although you have an insane vulnerability. Yeah. You know, and, and that's interesting because again, that starts to give context. That starts to give context even to the budget holders to say, hold on, I, I do care about that asset. <laughs> it's actually one that I really care about, right? And you guys saying you can't protect it. So you might have cases where they, and, and again, if they can find the budget, then you can protect it, right? Yeah. But I feel that that conversation with the business and getting that in an effective way is absolutely critical to have those business conversations where we're able to say, hey, we can protect you for this, but we cannot protect you for that. Yeah. I guess, you know, if we go further down the line and talking about, you know, security teams and, and, and aligning that business, you know, one of the key ben, key kind of, I guess, differentiators of that as well is staff, hiring key staff and retention of key staff. So what's yeah. your idea, you know, of how we can, you know, because the climate nowadays, I think it's it, 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 it's a funky climate. There's a lot of things happening. There's on the one side, you have layoffs. So on the other side, there is a big competition for talent, you know, so how, yeah. how do we retain, you know, and you hire, the, the the ace this, our talent in, in uh, our security teams. You talk about the, oh security. You talk about from a security point of view, right? Yeah. The risk of security. Well, I, I guess that's the job. You know, that's our job, right? I think, yeah. I think we we need to create environments, right, that attract talent, right? Create an environment that you know people want to work there. They have a, a, a good vision. They have a good direction. They can get on with it, right? They um, they can accelerate, right? And and I you know and also depends on the company, right? I, I you know I, I feel that. The, the, the talent looks at three things, right? You know, what the company you're working on, the direction, the, the transformation of what, what's going on there and, and the security sort of, you know, environment, right? And again, the security direction. And, you know, I, I think for our, our job is to create that, right? I, I feel that there's a lot of innovation going in the marketplace. And I feel that anybody that's, you know, a sort of a, a really, you know, up and coming or, or like that is on a security industry that does, does that wants to keep evolving, then they need to find those places. The, the thing about this is to take into account is that going to a bigger company doesn't necessarily mean that you, you get more growth, right? You can go to a, a bigger company, get a bigger salary, you know, be part of maybe even a, a, a great direction. But if you're not making a difference, if you're not at the part of the team that is actually learning, evolving, et cetera, then, you know, you're wasting your time, right? You know, you basically, three years from now, you're still going to be the same as you are now. I, I think, you know, our job is to create environments that attract talent that wants to grow, wants to change, wants to make a difference, right? Wants to be part of, I think, the big digital transformation that is happening in security, right? And I think if we do that, you know, we'll attract talent. And, and I think we need to know that the talent that we attract, as it gets better, might go somewhere else, right? And that's, look... Yeah. I view that as a success story, right? Like, you know, we, you know, we, 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 we help these individuals. They now found great jobs, but you never know. Like, you know, a lot of the times you find they, they, they come back. Right. And, um, but so you need to have that ability to make them better and to get value in a way, add value to the individuals and get value from them for the period. And the period could be two months, two years, five years. It doesn't matter. Right? As long as they're adding value, Right and and they're learning and they're evolving. I think it's a win-win situation. Yeah, and I think sometimes you know sometimes people kind of feel hesitant, you know, to let people go. But I think you just need to encourage people, let them grow, let them flourish. And and once once you can't offer them progression, let them fly. You know, they might exactly. come back some days. Yeah. I think I think the key point where you mentioned is, and I had a, again I had a few discussions over the last few days. It's creating a structure and a concept of where people can you know add value where you know sometimes we hire people we hire people for a particular reason let them you know if you hire an expert in say devops or devsecops 
let him be an expert. Don't tell him what to do. You know, ask them their opinion. You know, I spoke with some person the other day. They work in a consultancy business and they have eight managers and one counselor. And if they're talking about their career, they're not talking with their manager. They're talking with a counselor. So how yeah. do you get, how do you you know have a progression and direction in your career when you have eight managers, but you're talking about your career progression with a counselor? It, yeah, it becomes yeah. distorted, you know. So you know you need to make sure that you have things in place. Yeah, absolutely. I think Alan wants to chip in. There you are. Yeah, sorry, Jens. I didn't want to interrupt the the, the dialogue too much, which is why I was using the chat. Yeah, I think yeah. that last point, Marius, is a, is a is a particularly acute one. If your organization is big enough and or you've adopted matrix management such that you've got a people manager, a capability manager and a business manager, which I think is what you're describing there. Yeah. I don't think that works. I don't think that works either for the individual or the capability manager because the two of them end up being separated between what the capability manager wants from the individual in the short term and what the individual wants for their career development. Because the capability manager doesn't want to pay for that. So who's going to pay for the capability development? That's where the, pay, the people manager, the capability and the business actually need to be the same person because otherwise you have three competing conversations just about an individual, and I don't think it works. No, it doesn't work yeah. at all. That's what I'm saying. I had a conversation with a particular person that they've been in the business five months in this big, grand business, but they were talking with um, with a counsellor and with a, their manager about the career, but the thing is the manager said you need to talk with a counsellor, and then the counsellor does not communicate with the manager and there's mm -hmm. a distortion straight away and they were they thought that they made a mistake where they joined that business and it's a big big business big known business yeah so within five months they they thinking that they made a mistake yeah i think I, I think that's um i think that's a particular problem for people moving from their first two years where they're probably on a grad program that next year when you're no longer a grad and no longer fed and watered by the parent company that can be really quite difficult and I, i'd love to see some numbers in terms of what the churn rate is in the first year after somebody's finished the grad program because i suspect it's quite large whether it's more than 50 percent or not i don't know but i suspect it's quite a large number yeah, and sometimes, you know, just based on business, sometimes, you know, you as an employee, sometimes you need to navigate various structures and cultures. You know, I went, I just came from big corporate and joined a startup, whereas, you know, it's a completely different way of working, you know, mm -hmm. you get stuck in into various different things. There is, and the thing is sometimes, you know, and I, I interview now people, I say, you know, startup is not for everyone because if you're used to be in a structure where, you know, you get told, or you get checked in of, you know, you need to do this and that and that, and then you go and do it. In startup or, or in my way I manage, I just give you a, an end goal and however you reach it, it's up to you. I'm not gonna be there to tell you an hourly points, you know, what you need to do. That's the project, you know, that's the end deliverable. You mm -hmm. go and deliver it. And people Yeah, that's, I think that's difficult. where, that's where startups look for what we call self-starters, self-motivators. They're, yeah. they're people who absolutely are task-driven. You give them a task, a task and they go away and work out how they're going to do it. Um, uh, Denise, I think you've, you've, I can think of one example where you've recruited just that person. Yeah. Uh, and I'm thinking of Petra, uh, who's, yeah. who's gone on to, to do just that. She, you know, she's, She's progressed her career over the last yeah. three years. And I'm, I'm looking at it from the outside. You've got first-hand knowledge. But I think that is an example of, I hesitate to call her the ideal, but certainly pretty close to the ideal candidate that we're all looking for. Yeah. Well, it'll give them a problem and, and they get on with it, right? And then yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, yeah, I think back to when you shared your interview uh, with her and you set her a task and said, right, now present back how you're going to solve it. Um, I, I've certainly taken that, frankly, and copied it um, because it works. I like it. 
but yeah. it's it's not for everybody and i think that's probably the piece that we have to keep in mind yeah and, and here's the comment i was going to make which is you know in a weird way you know and as marius you you you, you were you know the premise here is that we need to interact a lot more with the business, right? But I actually found that sometimes the security members really resist that because yes. sometimes they almost want to go back to that bubble. The, the problem is that, you know, there's only so much you can do. There's a moment where you have to interact with the business and you're changing business process and then it gets messy, but it's it's messy because you have now more players in the mix, right? And, yeah. and I think finding that structure, finding that balance, figuring out how to do that effectively, it's not easy, right? But ultimately, I, I don't see a way around it because, you know, I like, I, I always take the view that I should not be talking to people, it's my team. Like if I have to act as a bridge between A and B, something is wrong, right? You know, like ultimately you almost, and I think there's a setting there, but, but yeah. like the view is that for me, the more junior the person, the higher they're speaking, the better the model is, because it means that that person has now evolved, they're learning, they found ways to communicate, right? You don't want this hierarchy being able to shift and arbitrate stuff. Like you almost want, you know, that to be connected. And of course, if it's not going to work, okay, then you go in and you figure out and you improve or you you mix it. But I've, I find that allowing the teams to experience the business to drive change ultimately in the medium term when you do find some gems or when people you know able to do it is a lot more effective because yeah just and there's happen. a there's there's a there's a benefit and if you pardon the expression but it's giving people enough rope to hang themselves and by oh, which yeah. i mean it's it's oh. giving people the enabling um remit if you will to go and solve the problem once you've given them the problem once you've defined the problem but also on the business side step in give them enough for for it. <laughs> yeah but it's it, it it's it is high risk you've got to you've got to have good people it only works with if you've got good quality people that, yeah, that yeah, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that is the base requirement for that approach. I know, I agree. Or you give enough time for your team to grow, right? You know, you. But but yes. ultimately, it's good for them, right? Like because they, you know, like they they start to learn how to do at more yeah. senior level. They even technical, right? like you know, I I take the view that we should be held accountable, right? So you know, there's nothing wrong with this team holding your team under pressure, making them accountable. And I think right. That's kind of in a way how I think the security teams are evolving because, you know, from legacy point of view, you used to be a department that's stuck somewhere in a dark room. And then more and more, we become a business facing function that yeah. you know, all, Mission you know, interacts with every single department. And even now, you know, I, quite, I mentor quite a lot of people that try to break into cybersecurity that always say to them, to them, you know, you can't think that you're going to be a keyboard warrior anymore. Whatever great idea you might manufacture, yeah. If you can't get a buy-in, if you can't translate it to the business, that idea, you never it, the idea is never going to flourish. It's never going to reach a day of light because mm -hmm. you need to be able to translate the idea to everyone that you know and get everyone on board on that journey for your idea. Yeah, I agree, guys. I do need to jump to the other session. You can actually continue. No, you two can continue if you want. Uh, I, I wish right? I could, you know, but there's meetings and at work happening. Uh, all right, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Fair I, I'm. I I had registered to join Saab's talk next. It's just that okay. I'm so let's let's early enough to join this. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, guys. Great, great insight. No, this was pretty good, Marius. Thanks for organizing. Thank you, guys. So thank you both.